Hi guys, thank you for coming uh, for another one of my videos. Today we will be watching um, the Battle of Taranto in 1940. It's the, apparently from the, the title of the video, it's the Pearl Harbor of the Mediterranean. Now, uh, this is a World War II video, and uh, I've recently been really on a World War II binge, and uh, I know a lot about the Second World War, but I want to know more, and I'm going to start making those uh, uh, World War Two videos on my on my channel. Uh, they will they would run for a little while, uh, <clears throat> so we'll see where it goes. I might do them for a month consecutively, or a few months, or maybe just a week. We'll see. Uh, now um, let's see what this video is all about. By the way, hey, this is Minko's bedroom. I hope it's not too loud. Kings and Generals, great channel by the way, great channel, I mean they do amazing videos. The devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 was the brainchild of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto and it had probably been influenced by two things, a prophetic novel, The Great Pacific War, written in 1925 by a mm -hmm. British writer, Hector what? Charles Bywater, I didn't know which gave this. a realistic account of a clash between Japan and the United States beginning with the Japanese destruction of the US Pacific Fleet and the Battle of Taranto, during which the British Royal Navy launched the first all-aircraft ship-to-ship naval attack in history against the Italian Regia Marina docked in Taranto Harbour. Today we're going to talk about this battle that is relatively unknown but changed so much. The sponsor of today's video, World of Warships Legends, wants to help in this are represented by three warships from the Alexandria, Gibraltar, Crete, and Malta, with the latter serving as a... Could you imagine being on a boat in the Second World War? How scary that is? Because it's one thing being an infantryman, or being in the air, uh, but being on a boat, like, if you're hit, that you, 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 you're done. You're, you're going to freeze to death, or drown, or... At least, if you're on foot, yeah, there's a lot of things to worry about. You have to worry about, uh, you know, aircrafts. Uh, you have to worry about other people, uh, other infantrymen. You have to worry about tanks, about jeeps, about uh, artillery. But at least there's a certain degree of control that you have on your survival. You know, uh, but on a boat, you're in the middle of the ocean. Good luck. Like if you're hit with a, with a torpedo, what, what are you going to do? You know, so... It must be really scary being on a, a navy man, especially in the war. A refueling point for Allied vessels between Alexandria and Gibraltar, as well as a submarine base. Malta served as a major thorn for Italian supply lines to North Africa. Britain had devised plans to attack Taranto as early as 1935, after Italy invaded Abyssinia, in order to blunt the power of the Italian navy, the Regia Marina. In 1930, which was a very strong navy, by the way, crisis, the British Italian commander one. of the Mediterranean fleet, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, was concerned about the survival of the fleet if Italy attacked. What a name! So he ordered his staff to name Dr. Cash against Taranto. Captain of the HMS Glorious, Lumley Lister, advised him that his fairy swordfish biplane torpedo bombers were capable of night attacks, inspiring the battle. Were those? planes bought from the French or is it just just the French model because you know the flag and everything. plan codenamed Operation Judgment. In 1940, both nations' supply lines to their respective North African campaigns were suffering as the supply convoys had the ordeal of traversing the Mediterranean under the threat of the other's fleet. The mm. British supply convoys to Egypt had to cross the Mediterranean Sea via Gibraltar or Malta dangerously close to Sicily, or take the long route around the Cape of Good Hope and coming up the Suez Canal. While the latter was a long and slow route, going through the Mediterranean was far more costly, as the Italian navy was in an excellent position to intercept them. Well, yeah, it must be very... Italy was following the especially... Being concept, keeping their warships in harbor... Especially because uh, the Italy is so close to the convoy routes, so they don't have to patrol like a whole ocean to stop uh, supplies. They just have to go off, to, off their coast, and they're very close to their uh, 
mainland, so to speak. And not risking a battle at sea where they might lose them. While the British sought a decisive naval battle because Italy's strategy stopped Britain from separating naval forces in the Mediterranean under fear the Italian navy would destroy them. Thus, for the Italians, this defensive strategy served to hinder British operations at little cost. <coughs> Alongside the Italian problem was the fall of France and the consequent loss of the French fleet in the Mediterranean. Britain could not allow French warships to fall into Axis hands and had to devise a plan to... Yeah, they bombed them. This prompted the British Royal Navy to perform Operation Catapult on yeah. the 3rd of July 1940. A naval attack against the French ships in the naval base of Mers el Kabir at Oran in French Algeria. What is significant about this attack was that on the 8th of July, British carrier HMS Hermes deployed six swordfish torpedo bombers of the 814 squadron, which struck the French battleship Richelieu's starboard side, tearing a hole and severely damaging her. The British pilots had gained valuable experience at aerial torpedo attacking a large ship at port mere months before Operation Judgment was to take place. It was scheduled for October 21st, 1940, on Trafalgar Day. Operation Judgment's naval task force was commanded by Rear Admiral Lister and consisted of the carrier HMS Illustrious, heavy cruisers HMS Berwick and HMS York, light cruisers HMS Gloucester and Glasgow, destroyers HMS Hyperion, Elex, Hasty and Havelock. Over 21 swordfish were to be deployed. Can you have a more British fleet in terms of name? Glasgow, York, Gloucester, Berwick, like. Deployed from the 806, <laughs> 813, 815, 819, and 824th Naval Air Squadrons. The Fairy Swordfish was a biplane designed by the Fairy Aviation Company and introduced in 1936. Never mind. The slow speed of the aircraft required it to make long straight approaches. But the aircraft had one unique perk, the ability to operate at night. Its strength lay in the ability to be... What do you mean operate at night? Like other aircraft couldn't? Like, what? I hope he explains it because, like what, if you're a normal aircraft at the time, at night, you couldn't see or you couldn't operate? Like, I don't know. I don't know, what was the limitation in other aircraft? He's thrown out during atrocious weather conditions but still take off because of incredible handling and maneuverability. Mm -hmm. The Swordfish was reliable and ideal for safely launching from carriers, and this was critical at night. Half of the Swordfish were armed with 18-inch Mark II torpedoes, with the other half carrying 250-pound aerial bombs and flares for diversionary attacks. The torpedoes were fitted with a duplex pistol device that used duplex magnetic contact exploders. The Taranto force felt safe in their 40 foot deep harbor water, believing that airdropped torpedoes never feel could safe. Be effectively launched in such shallow waters. However, the British attached wire to each torpedo nose, holding it up as it fell into the water, producing a belly flop instead of a dive. This would allow them to be dropped in water as shallow as 22 feet. That's Despite smart. This, That's really Italians smart, actually. Not aware of the duplex pistol innovation. Which allows torpedoes to explode. It's very interesting how you can change, like a whole technology, upgrade it with just a piece of wire. <laughs> like without that piece of wire, you can do a certain action, which is critical in this case. But with just a piece of wire, it's insane how you know, you make a small change and it, you know everything can change. Explode underneath the ships, which would prove to be a critical oversight. The torpedo-equipped planes under moonlight would strike the battleships moored in the outer harbor, while the bombers would aim for ships and installations in the inner basin. The attack would consist of two waves, one coming in from the west towards the rising moon and another from the north. Both waves would have aircraft shooting flares over the battleships to illuminate them. To protect the torpedo planes, it was decided that a distraction was required to keep the searchlights directed upwards and not directly at the torpedo planes. Thus, some of the dive bomber swordfish would attack the dockyards and ships in Mar Piccolo. Several reconnaissance flights by Martin Merrylands of the RAF No. 431 General Reconnaissance Flight, coming from Malta, confirmed the location of the Regia Marina. 
these scouts found the defences of Taranto to hold 101 anti-aircraft guns, 193 machine guns, and 90 low-flying barrels. Damn, were they precise. I mean, how can you see from, I'm guessing, very high up? Such a precise number. Like, did they have, like, special equipment to see this? Like, 101 AA guns? 193 machine guns? Like, were they, like, easily uh, observable? Were they illuminated? Like, that's, that's, that's insane to me. Like, how, just from a plane flying up, and I get it, you can have a sort of an eagle view, uh, but to give an exact number, like, oh yeah, there's a hundred uh, AA guns uh, over there. I saw it with my eyes. Like, what? Were there like maybe like a few people on the plane? Like, one was flying the plane, the other was just observing. Was that what was going on? Because it's insane to me. Like, you're just flying up high. You're trying to not be detected. And I'm guessing this is just a guess. You're not flying. Maybe I'm wrong here. You're not flying on a full moon because you'll be easily uh, seen. So, like, how can you observe so concretely, give a number so specific? Blooms. However, by early November, a storm had hit the port, leaving only 27 blooms. The Regia Mariner What's a balloon, in Taranto man? during the battle consisted of six battleships, nine heavy cruisers, seven light cruisers, and 13 destroyers. The defences of Taranto Harbour consisted of anti-torpedo nets, but Italy had two problems. You never heard of this. Netting and an inadequate design. So I guess it's just a net that stops the torpedo. But... Meters of netting, but they only had 4,200 metres when the attack occurred. Uh, yeah. The netting was designed to protect against torpedoes armed with contact pistols, protecting the sides of a battleship, and only had a depth of its maximum draft. Because of this, torpedoes could pass beneath the ship, providing almost no defense against the duplex pistol-armed torpedoes. The British had calculated a set run of 27 knots at a preset depth of 33 feet. This would allow the torpedoes to pass under the Italian anti-torpedo nets, while the duplex magnetic pistols would still sense a warship above and detonate. Wow, judgment was part of a that's smart. operation called MB8, requiring multiple naval forces to coordinate. The rationale for the complex... You know, when you hear about certain operation like this, uh, operations like this, it's insane to me how, how much logistics goes into it. Because it's not just, oh, we're going to use these planes. You have to be really... It's, it's, it's insane when you start reading about the Second World War because... You, you know, you hear about all these operations about uh, from uh, from all sides, from the Germans, from the Russians, from the uh, English and American side. How, you know, you think about just one operation, one uh, mission that's in the grand scheme of things very simple. But how much logistics and how much preparation, and how, how many resources are allocated and needed for the operation to be successful? And that's just one piece in the, the whole war. It's just one thing that's very complicated, very, you know... ...movement of so many convoys and task forces was to confuse the Italian reconnaissance planes and not to give away the real intent to attack Taranto. Yeah. The surprise for the attack was paramount. Thus, when HMS Illustrious left port on November 7th, it was publicly announced to be supporting a convoy on its way to Malta. During the sunset on November 10th, Illustrious secretly detached from the convoy fleet and headed northeast in a direction just 170 miles southeast of Taranto. The original date for the attack was October 21st, but because of a fire erupting on the HMS Illustrious, it had to be rescheduled for November 11th, a night that would hold enough moonlight for aircraft to launch. On the night of November 11th, 1940, 21 swordfish were launched in two waves, the first consisting of 12, airborne by 8.40 p.m., and the second consisting of 9 by 9.34 p.m. Six aircraft of the first wave and four of the second wave carried the 250-pound aerial bombs and flares. At 4 minutes to 11 p.m., the first wave split into two sections, with three bombers and one torpedo bomber straying from the main force. The smaller force continued to Taranto, 
while the main force approached the harbour at Margrave at 2258. Over 16 flares were dropped east of the harbour by Lieutenant Kigel and Lieutenant Lam, while they bombed oil depots, setting them ablaze. The next three torpedoes also there was a diversion by Lieutenant Commander Williamson's 815 squadron flew over Fulmine and Lampo, launching a torpedo and striking battleship Conte de Cavour, blasting a 27-foot hole in her side below the waterline. But he was basically As Williamson tried to pull away from the Conte de Cavour, he was shot down by her anti-aircraft guns. Both so Williamson and his co-pilot Lieutenant Scarlett survived crashing into the harbour, but were taken captive. The other two planes dodged the barrage blooms and were lightly hit by anti-aircraft fire from the Italian warships and shore batteries. They attempted to attack the battleship Andrea Doria, but missed. Lieutenant Kemp and Lieutenant Swain's plane came around both sides of battleship Littorio, launching torpedoes, hitting her on the starboard bow and on the port quarter, sending Littorio into the mud bow first. Lieutenant Morn's aircraft came directly at the battleship Vittorio Veneto, launching a torpedo, but it ran aground before hitting her. Yeah. The bomber force, led by Captain Opach RM, attacked two cruisers moored at Marpicolo, hitting both with a single bomb at 1500 feet. At 11.05 pm, Lieutenant Murray attempted to dive bomb the destroyer Levecchio but his bombs failed to detonate. Oh, come on! Lieutenant Sara could not manage to get close to a warship target and opted to bomb the seaplane base, severely damaging it. Well, so yeah, Lieutenant I mean, Ford, very smart because I'm guessing he was just, uh, he was, I don't know what his orders were, but he improvised, I guess. Or maybe that was his orders in the beginning. But dropped bombs on a cruiser, but was unable to confirm any explosions. The second wave of eight aircraft had one plane, flown by Lieutenant Clifford, accidentally collide with another aircraft while launching and required last oh, okay. repairs. I thought he just collided like in mid-air. <laughs> you know, you were just flying uh, above the battle and you just collide with like an ally. That would be so in improbable. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? Still, he launched 25 minutes after to make a solo run. The second wave approached from a northerly direction towards the Mar Grande Harbour. Lieutenant Hamilton and Lieutenant Skelton dropped flares shortly before midnight and headed towards the oil storage depots to bomb them. Commanding the force, Lieutenant Hale came from the north, lining up with the battleship Littorio. Alongside him was Lieutenant Torin Spence and Lieutenant Bailey. The latter was shot down on approach by the heavy cruiser Dorizia's anti-aircraft guns. Um. Both he and his co-pilot died. Hale and Torren Spence both launched torpedoes at the Littorio, with one successfully hitting her on the stern. Despite taking heavy anti-aircraft fire, both aircraft managed to pull away. Behind them came their Imagine how scary! Imagine how scary it must be to be like a pilot, and like how about all those uh, I don't know what they're called, like the bombs of the A that just blow up like uh, very near to you, near your uh, your aircraft. How scary and how anxious would you be if you're in that situation? Because it's just, I mean, the anxiety levels must be extremely high, man. You just, because you don't have control, you're just basically flying on luck. You know, if one hits you, it hits you. If it doesn't... Launching a torpedo at Cayo Duilio, hitting her on the starboard side, blowing a hole in her hull, and flooding both of her forward magazines. The final aircraft of the second wave, flown by Lieutenant Wellam, coming over the town of Taranto, approached the flagship Vittorio Veneto, launching a torpedo that missed. The mm. aircraft was heavily damaged by anti-aircraft fire, but managed to limp back to the illustrious. Arriving 15 minutes late and alone on the scene was Lieutenant Clifford. He attempted what? a dive bombing attack on the Italian cruiser Trento. Come on, Clifford! complete attention of all the anti-aircraft fire. He dropped his bombs, only to see them cleanly hit Trento without detonation. Miraculously, he was able to fly out of Taranto. What? Really heavy okay, so that that's a this way more recurring occurrence than that I thought it was gonna be like just uh, uh, launching your bombs, they fall and they don't detonate. I mean, it's not like a one in a hundred uh, in a million type of situation. It's very at least at the time it was very. Uh, it was a recurrence that happened very often, I guess. Fire. 
the British lost two planes, with two crew members taken prisoner and two killed. The Regia Mariner suffered significant losses. The battleship Conte de Cavour had a 39 by 26 foot hole in its hull. 27 of her crew were killed, with 100 wounded. She fell to the bottom of the shallow water, with only her superstructure and main armaments remaining above water. Okay, so it's not. It wasn't very. Uh, it wasn't very deep. So even if they sunk. Okay. again. The battleship Cayo Duilio had a 36 by 23 foot hole, but was saved before running aground. The battleship Littorio had been hit by three torpedoes, leading to considerable flooding and the ship's bowels being totally submerged by the next morning. 32 of her crew died, with many wounded. Heavy cruiser Trento was damaged by an unexploded bomb that tore a hole in one of her fuel tanks, taking two months to repair. Destroyers Lebeche and Persenio, both hit by unexploded bombs, required minor repairs. Okay, so I guess now he will explain the consequences of this mission, but from my point of view right now, I mean, yes, they accomplished the mission, and they, and they damaged a few boats, a few ships, uh, but I, I don't understand what, what the big deal is. Like, yes, listen, yes, a few ships were sunk, a few of them, like two or three, but if they had like 30 ships and you sink or you damage four, five, six of them, I have to, I hope he explains the overall uh, consequences of this, this mission. Taking a month each. It took four months to repair Latorio, seven months for Dulio, with Conte de Cavour never seeing completion. Two Italian aircraft were destroyed on the ground. The seaplane hangars, oil depots and harbour were oh, yeah. damaged. Oh, yeah. An estimated 15,000 rounds from shore-fired batteries and warships had landed in the city of Taranto, which lay in shambles. The Italian fleet lost half its capital ships in one night. The next day, the Regia Marina was forced to transfer its undamaged warships from Taranto to Naples to thwart new attacks. The balance of power swung firmly into British hands in the oh, okay, okay, okay. who could now operate with much greater liberty, capable of splitting into two battle groups rather than sticking as one at all times. Okay. Prior to the attack on Taranto, aerial torpedo experts around the world believed torpedo attacks against ships required water at least 75 feet deep. Taranto Harbour had a depth of 33 feet, and the British were able to okay, okay. their methods to compensate for this. Isoroku Yamamoto ordered Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Naito to investigate the incident, and he quickly flew to Taranto. His report went directly to Yamamoto, and he later spoke to Commander Mitsuo Fujita, the man who led the first wave of air attacks on Pearl Harbor. While the attack on Taranto was not the match to ignite the Japanese plans for Pearl Harbor, it demonstrated the soundness of such tactics and cemented Japan's resolve to go through with its plans. Prior to the attack on Taranto, Yamamoto's proposal for an attack on Pearl Harbor met with great resistance in both the military and naval circles of Japan. Wow! But How everything just connects! You know, if this attack wasn't successful or it didn't even happen, then the Japanese maybe wouldn't have attacked the Americans and they would have gone, I don't know what they would have gone. You know, it's interesting how one small piece of action, one small piece can change the whole of history. Because if this attack didn't reach the, the years of Yamamoto and he didn't... Uh, you know, put, uh, showcase it to his, you know, people in charge and people were not uh, convinced that he could work on Pearl Harbor. Maybe they wouldn't have attacked at Pearl Harbor in the first place and then the world could be maybe the same, but it could be completely different as well. So that's very interesting how everything ties together. For his plan. More videos on naval warfare are on the way. So make sure you're subscribed and have pressed the bell button. To yeah, see the go subscribe guys, in the King's series. General. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing. It helps immensely. Our video... Listen guys, this is this was a very interesting video. Thank you for uh, for watching. I hope you watched till the end. And my point of view is, it's insane when you read or listen in this case about history, how you, you, you change one 
court, one piece uh, of history and it can have like it can unravel history to proportions that you couldn't expect because this is just a, a another battle on the grand scheme of things in the war yeah, yes did it give uh, the British uh, sort of uh, supremacy uh, for their convoys so they're able to uh, operate in the Mediterranean yes but in the grand scheme of things it's interesting how a small battle like this changed the whole approach that the Japanese uh, undertook against the Americans. And it's very, very, very interesting. Uh, especially the further go, the further back you go in history, one small change uh, in, a, in an important piece of, um, of history could, could completely change how the world is today. Like if you, if you go back a few centuries and you smell you change uh, the outcome of one battle the outcomes or the consequences of that battle could be insignificant or they could be depending on on the battle and uh, the campaign but anyways thank you for listening guys this was battle of torrento 1940 i learned a lot actually uh it was very interesting and i'll see you guys in the next video thanks for listening